Havlicek steals it. Havlicek stole the ball. Down goes Frazier. Down goes Frazier. I'm Chris Fowler for Sports Century. Arriving in the season after Jackie Robinson torched baseball's racial barrier in 1947, he kept the Dodger house cool, calm, and collected. Equal parts African American and Italian, Roy Campanella played godfather to all colors and creeds, while Robinson drew the heat of fanaticism and fired back in kind. As the Major League's first black catcher, he won three MVP awards causing Hall of Famer Ty Cobb to predict that Campanella will be remembered longer than any other catcher. Perhaps, but Campy's glorious decade in Brooklyn was only part one of his legacy. Part two began on a winter night in 1958. He loved life more than anyone I know. He just enjoyed himself. Anything he did, he enjoyed. I don't think there was a day that he played in the major leagues that he didn't wake up in the morning and say, thank God I'm going to play the major leagues today. He was the most grateful person I ever saw of playing major league baseball. So full of life, so full of enthusiasm. He just loved to play the game. He was like a little kid. He came up with a line that I think is immortal. You've got to have a lot of little boy in you to play this game. And you do. Campanella had three most valuable player awards in his pocket. Now it's spring training. This great star, he just started taking care of the bats like a bat boy. He did this for two or three innings. That was the way Campanella was. He was just unassuming, and yet he was a star. Campy could get along with anyone. Yeah, you talk to him two minutes, he'd win you. Mm -hmm. You don't care white, black, green, gray. Race didn't matter with Campy. <laughs> Roy lived it up, and, and he loved the fact that he was successful. Once he hit the big time, he bought J.P. Morgan's estate out in Long Island. He was making $36,000. He came into my office, and he said, Buzzy, I just bought a home in Glen Cove. I said, that's great, Campy. How much you pay for it? He said, $52,000. I said, well, you can afford that. He said, I bought a boat. I said, well, I figured he bought a rowboat. I said, how much you pay for the boat? He said, $56,000. He bought a house for 52 and a boat for 56 I didn't have 15 cents in the bank. But that was camping. Never had a care in the world. When I was a kid growing up in Brooklyn, they always had these pictures of Roy's train set. He apparently had one of the biggest electric train collections in his basement in the world. And he loved tropical fish. He had an enormous rare tropical fish collection and these enormous fish tanks. He could work with concrete, wood, um, cars, landscaping. It's just amazing. A lot of people thought he was just a baseball player. Campanella was a dude. He was out there, he, he was in the newspaper society columns. He was a much flashier guy than most of those other Dodgers. Sugar Ray Robinson used to have a big Cadillac in Harlem, a special paint job. Well, anytime Sugar Ray would drive 125th Street, everybody knew Sugar Ray was here. Campy got him a Cadillac, had it painted gold. And he says, man, when I drive down Arlo, <laughs> they all know, old Campy's going to be at the store. Let's go. Campy saw that there was money to be made by opening a liquor store in Harlem. Ricky tried to talk him out of it. Ricky went to Campy and said, you know, Campy, wouldn't it be a lot better if you opened a sporting goods store? And he told Ricky, that may be, but, you know, this is what my people need, and this is what what I'm going to do. When you go to Campus liquor store, you would have people in there never had a drink in their life. They would come by just to go to Campus store. They wanted to see Campus. In the early hours of a cold January morning in 1958, the man who loved life had finished a double shift at his Manhattan liquor store. After locking up, he drove out of the city toward his suburban home on Long Island not in his Cadillac, but his Chevrolet. This car needed some service. 
And he left it with the agency, and he had a loaner. And I don't think it was as big a car as he was used to driving. And now he was driving on icy roads in a dark community. As he got closer to his home in Glen Cove, he had to go through an S-curve, but didn't realize that there were patches of ice in the middle of it. And in the midst of that loss control, he may have been going around 40 miles an hour when he hit that turn. There was a pole there on the corner of Apple Tree Lane and DeSource Lane, and it looks like he hit that pole and then bounced off it and flipped. The neighbor across the street was a doctor. He rushed out with his medical bag. He gave my father a shot of morphine for the pain and contacted the ambulance to police. Police officer Roger Weldon was one of the first to arrive on the scene. When that car flipped, he just went from the left-hand side by the steering wheel and his buttocks hit that side window and that's how it got smashed. He was sitting right in the glass at the time when I arrived. I asked him how he was and he said, I feel fine. I said, you all right? He said, yeah, I just can't move my legs. He said, my legs are not. He wasn't cut or bruised or no marks or scars or bleeding. When I got the call, I went up there to the scene. At that point, the record was already there. The car was still on its side and they were getting ready to lift it up. Officer Pepline, who was deceased now, was the officer that climbed in there to grab him and hold him while they pulled the car up. I could hear him saying, I can't feel my legs, as he was coming out of the car. He just dozed off, which could happen to anybody coming home work late at night. There was no alcohol, according to the police report. Yeah. Not far from the accident, Ruthie Campanella was awakened by police and given the shocking news about her husband. We all broke out in tears and crying and very upset. And not longer than two or three hours later, the press come knocking at our door. After being treated at the scene, Campanella was rushed to Glen Cove Community Hospital to alert the emergency room staff Dr. W. Spencer Gurney radioed ahead. He said, we've got Roy Campanella in this ambulance and we're on the way to the hospital. The press received word of the accident shortly thereafter. My mother really got upset because here, my dad had just been in a tragic car accident and they're banging on the door and wanting a story. The man known to his adoring fans as Campy lay on the operating table for over four hours while surgeons worked to repair two broken vertebrae. That afternoon, Dodgers owner Walter O'Malley, who only three months earlier had incurred the wrath of millions by deciding to move the Dodgers from Brooklyn to Los Angeles, addressed the New York press. Well, you've been up there with the doctors. Uh, what does it look like now? Well, I'm very thankful. I think Roy is gonna be all right. A lot of prayers were answered. Uh, Roy had a broken neck, but the spinal cord is intact. The doctor did a wonderful job, and so did this voluntary hospital. Uh, knowing Roy as I do and his ruggedness, I think Roy will be back. We never thought it was going to be that serious. No one did. No, even the doctors. Uh, they called me, and uh, the doctor said uh, he, he had an accident. It looks like he's going to be all right. But two days later, he was paralyzed. Doctor, do you think that... Roy will be able to play baseball again? I cannot say. Is, uh, uh, do you think that, uh, there's, time. that there's a possibility that he will? There is the possibility. Three days after the operation, Campanella's condition worsened when he was stricken with pneumonia, his left lung collapsing. It's a shock when you see a friend of yours laying immobile on a table and there's like a hinge or something in his head. Plus, you know, wires are pulling his neck back. That brace here, tubes are there, tubes are here, and he's laying there, and he's saying, is he dead? The shock in Brooklyn was that team was gone, and, and it almost seemed as if, as if Campanella's accident was, I've just been hitting the head with a sledgehammer on one side, and now you're going to hit me on the head on the other side. It was like a one-two punch. The Dodgers are gone, and Campy's gone. Although the pneumonia passed, Campanella's paralysis remained unchanged. Strapped to his bed, he lay in traction for seven weeks. I thought this would be particularly difficult for Campanella because he's kind of a physical guy. He's sort of a really man-child in the promised land. For somebody who was 
essentially physical and has certain qualities of a kid. To lose the use of the arms and legs is going to be just simply devastating. When Roy realized the extremity of his, his injuries, uh, part of his initial reaction was, you know, I don't want to live like this. I'm an athlete. I can't be trapped in this body for the rest of my life. He didn't want to see people. He didn't want to see anybody but his wife. He wouldn't see his children. He kept himself in this dark room, just literally trapped because he couldn't move. He said, I was ready to die. I would rather die than, than live like this. I think if Campanella hadn't been a baseball player or hadn't been with the Dodger organization, he might have taken his own life. Why did it have to be me? Why me? I never hurt anybody. He was a miserable young man. After more than three months at the Glen Cove Hospital, Roy Campanella was transferred to the Rusk Institute in Manhattan for rehabilitation. Unable to move from his chest down, the 36-year-old was still deep in the throes of depression. It hit me like a brick against my head how difficult his life was. In an article published years after the accident, chief physician Dr. Howard Rusk vividly described the extent of Campanella's paralysis upon arrival at the Rehabilitation Institute, saying his body was as unresponsive as stone. He had slight movement in his wrists and could extend and bend his arms, but not his fingers. One of his doctors came in and said to him, you know, Roy, I thought you would be different. I thought you would really be a fighter, but I'm really disappointed in you. And, and that sort of struck Roy, and he told Roy that he could be an inspiration for other people. There were other people in the hospital in worse shape than he was, I and mean, they were doing better than he was. There was a kid in the hospital who was about 10 years old. He had no arms, no legs. The kid wore a leather body stocking and rolled down the halls of the hospital. And Campy told me that this kid rolled into Campanella's room. And Roy said, I was sitting there with tears coming down my cheeks. He said, that kid looked up at me and said, are you feeling sorry for yourself again? And rolled out of the room. And Campanella told me that, that kid did more to help him mentally with his rehab than any other thing. Dodgers pitcher Carl Erskine was the first teammate to visit Campy at the Rusk Institute. Dodgers were playing in Philadelphia, and it rained. And Erskine got on the train and came to New York and went to the Rusk Institute to see Campanella, the man he thought would hit 61 home runs in the Coliseum. And he saw this body strapped to a frame and he looked at Campy, and Campy looked at Carl, and they both began to cry. I think Roy saw the whole team when he saw me. My first shock was that Roy was in this bed that was upside down. I mean, he was facing down in this apparatus, this bed that was holding his neck. And I remember the first thing he said to me after we kind of broke his silence. He said, Erskine, you got to check on this insurance. My whole major medical was used up in the first few days the train back to Philly. I cut this fixation of Roy in my mind every pitch of that ball game. I had a no-hitter going into the seventh inning. I beat the Phillies that night two to one and pitched a complete game. That was my last complete game in the big leagues. If Erskine was inspired by his former battery mate, Campanella sought daily nourishment from a higher source. He'd be looking face down. Under his face was an open Bible and he says, this is what I do every day. I still read my Bible. He said, they have to turn me so often. And when they turn me, I always have the Bible, and I read it, and they turn those pages for me. And I thought, I said, now here's a guy. Don't know whether he's going to live or die, but he's, his face is strong, so he's going to be OK. He says, this is what the good Lord wanted me to do, and the good Lord's going to take care of me. And there was a Danish surgeon there. And he said, there's a very strong rate of suicide among quadriplegics. And I said, well, how do you account for Roy Campanella? And the surgeon said, he chose life. I believe I will someday. And then if I don't, I still believe I'll make it. Good, he said, ma'am, I can give myself a drink of water. And we said, really? He said, now, no matter what happens, don't touch me. He reaches out, cups finally gets it in his hand, 
It looked like it's two days, and he's bringing this up, and sweat starts breaking out on him. He finally got it up there, and... <sighs> he said, man, you don't know what it's like to know that you can give yourself a drink. Campanella struggled to improve through the summer of 1958, and by September, he was allowed to leave Rusk Institute on weekends. Roy, what's the best medicine you've had so far? Well, uh, I'd say uh, going home uh, to my wife and children last weekend, that's uh, the best pill I've had so far. During one of those weekends, Campanella went to a World Series game at Yankee Stadium and, with mixed emotions, experienced a form of public rebirth. They brought Roy down to a field box level seat. There was no way to get the wheelchair down into that area. They had to lift him and carry him down. And this, of course, was before tens of thousands of people. Roy was tremendously embarrassed with this. And, and as people realized what was happening, they all began to cheer. It captured for Roy just all of the embarrassment of being paralyzed and yet the warmth of what people felt there. That November, Campanella was discharged from the Rusk Institute. Then, within days of the first anniversary of his near-fatal crash, the specter of sudden death rushed him again. His tractor trailer, some type of machinery fell off in front of him. Luckily, my father had a seatbelt on. There was a lot of damage done to the car, it was total, but he was not injured at all from the accident. Giving gloomy credence to the popular notion that bad things happen in threes, Campanella was caught by a freak turn of weather at the Dodgers spring training camp in Vero Beach, Florida. It was a beautiful day. And all of a sudden, the guy on the PA system says, people, we're stopping this game. Everybody get in their cars and go home. There's a storm heading this way. Within about 10 minutes, we had hailstones as big as baseball falling on us. But we were all in the clubhouse. Campanella was in his car. He had a convertible. We couldn't get him out in time. So we left him in the car. Those baseballs that were falling from the sky wrecked his car. Campanella didn't get a scratch. Maybe he was right. Maybe the good Lord was taking care of him. O'Malley had a heart of gold, and I know he took care of Campy. Unfortunately, you know, the pension plan did not provide a whole lot of money for Roy, the disability portion of it. So O'Malley put him on the payroll. While deeply appreciated, the Dodger owner's assistants did not begin to cover Campanella's medical bills that had spiraled so high that he was forced to sell his yacht and his estate. But help was on the way. Roy lost financially all that he had. Um, we played a benefit game both in L.A. and in New York with the Yankees to defray medical expenses for Roy. At the Los Angeles Coliseum on May 7, 1959, the largest crowd in Major League Baseball history honored the Dodgers' tragic hero. Pee Wee Reese, the captain, was the one that wheeled the chair out to home plate when it was dark, and everybody lit a match, and 90,000 people holding candles on matches. It was a very, very moving scene. Sea of lights at the Coliseum, perhaps the most beautiful and dramatic moment in the history of sports. Let there be a prayer for every light. And wherever you are, maybe you, in silent tribute to Campanella, can also say a prayer for his well-being. I want to thank each and every one of you from the bottom of my heart. This is something that I'll never forget as long as I live. It's a wonderful tribute. And I thank God that I'm here living Thanks a million. Campy at that time had to know that there are many, many people who really cared for him. Probably his greatest friend was Peter O'Malley and Walter. And I think they gave him a new start to another life. He did say to Pee Wee that this was the greatest day of his life. That's a hell of a thing to say for somebody who's in a wheelchair. 
While publicly keeping his spirits high, Campanella faced mounting problems at home. Ruthie Campanella did respond certainly the way anybody would, would hope their wife would respond initially. But when it became clear that Roy was going to be paralyzed for life, that he was going to require constant maintenance, this seemed to be more than Ruthie could handle. And she began to drink much more heavily. She apparently began to have affairs with other men. As a quadriplegic, Campanella had to struggle with the idea of what part of his manhood was left. Him. Physically, he was extraordinarily limited, and his wife let him know that in some particularly cruel ways and flaunted her infidelities. I know they had a number of calls down there. We'd get the call, we'd end up down there, we'd go in, and uh, he'd be in his chair, and she'd be screaming and yelling, and she had a few drinks, and she wanted him out of the house, and we tried to tell her as little where he can go. She was a very bitter woman at that point. In August of 1960, Campanella filed for divorce, claiming that Ruthie was adulterous and physically abusive. But although Campy reconsidered and ended divorce proceedings, the couple separated. The marriage was breaking up before he was paralyzed. Coming after he had the accident, it was uh, you know, like a double, double whammy. The acrimony ended in January of 1963, when Ruthie died of a heart attack. Campanella, living in Harlem, had met Roxy Doles, a former nurse. They were living in the same apartment building. Campanella was on this elevator that Roxy got on. And Roy told me, he said, how do you hit on this beautiful lady from a wheelchair? <laughs> right? <laughs> but that didn't stop him. It was the greatest thing that could have ever happened to him. I don't know what would happen if she hadn't come along. God bless Roxy. She just loved Roy. And Roy, Roy was so happy with her. He was the luckiest man in the world to have a wife like Roxy. And she took care of him the way no man was ever taken care of before. I always tell Roxy she should be nominated for sainthood for what she did for Roy Campanella and the way she stood by this guy and protected him and helped him and went through so much. Not only did it help him, but I think it also helped the entire family. Being without a mom and my dad being paralyzed, we were worried about how we were gonna get on with our lives too. It was simply remarkable. The fellow I knew before the accident who was a little superficial was gone. He seemed to have discovered peace in the wheelchair. Campanella came from a section of Philadelphia called Nice Town. His father was Italian, his mother was black. But as far as the uh, life in the world went on, he was regarded as black. He was never fully accepted in either community. Even in the black community, they would call him half-breed. Sometimes he was playing on all black teams because there were no whites allowed. Other times, um, because of his great skills, he would be the only black player on a white team. But I don't think Roy ever saw it as, as a handicap or something that held him back. If anything, it was something that gave him greater insights into the world. I once asked him, how did you become a catcher? I became a catcher, said Roy, when I was in high school. And the coach said on our first day of trying out, go to the position you want to cover. So he said, I ran to the outfield, and there were 70 guys in left, and 60 in center, and 50 in right, and I looked behind home plate, and there was nobody. He said, as fast as my little legs could waddle me, I became a catcher. Roy proved to be a natural behind the plate. In his sophomore year, a representative of the Baccarat Giants, a prominent all-black semi-pro team, called at the Campanella home. At first, his mother said, no, I, I don't want my boy leaving home at, at this age. This was the Depression, and they told her that they would pay him $35 for two games. And $35 was more than his father often made in a week, working hard on that vegetable truck. And uh, it sort of opened up their eyes that this is not just a game, this is an opportunity. Displaying a strong arm, Roy soon became a prime prospect. In 1937, he signed for $60 a month plus expenses with the Baltimore Elite Giants, one of the top teams in the Negro Leagues. He was just 15. I said, now listen, let me tell you something, youngster. I'm gonna get on base, and you know what? I'm going to steal on the first pitch, seeking you throw. OK, walk me. 
first pitch I stole, he threw the ball to center field. Uh-huh. I laughed at him. I laughed about it. Came to Kansas City about a month later. He said, Buck, I'm going to put you on again. I want you to run. I said, OK. Put me on. First pitch, I'm off. I'm out so far, I turn around to come back. And he's laughing. I used to see Roy at Kaminsky Park in Chicago, where the Negro League would have its annual All-Star game. And I was amazed at this young guy who had such a command of a team. He hit 300 for six consecutive seasons uh, in the Negro Leagues. He twice beat out Josh Gibson as the Negro League's all-star catcher. Roy loved the life. He loved the traveling life. This was all adventure to him. We saw all the great entertainment because all the great entertainers, we travel right in the same circuit that they traveled in. Carl Basip, uh-huh, Duke Ellington playing at the Earl's Theater. Hey, this was a good life. In October of 1945, Campanella reached his future home park, Brooklyn's Ebbets Field, where he played in a series of all-star games against major league players. Dodger GM Branch Rickey, who was rumored to be interested in starting a new black franchise, had compiled a dossier on Campanella. Oscar Charleston, the great Negro League star, was operating as a scout for the Brooklyn Brown Dodgers, which was the front organization that Branch Rickey ran to achieve his goal of integrating Major League Baseball. He let the public presume that he was recruiting a team for a new Negro Baseball League that he was backing. There was a rumor going around that Ricky was about to start a new Negro League, and the Dodgers, the Brooklyn Ball Club, was going to be called the Brooklyn Brown Dodgers. But the rumor was a cover. Jackie Robinson had secretly signed to play for the Montreal Royals, the Dodgers AAA Farm Club, and Ricky had yet to announce the news. Originally, he wanted to sign several black players at once. He didn't want to sign just Robinson alone. Ricky, who still had not made public his contract with Robinson, met with a 23-year-old catcher. Her conversation was a four-hour study in miscommunication. The result, Campanella was thinking brown Dodgers, not blue. Campanella got it into his head. He was sure that Ricky was offering him was a job with the Brooklyn Brown Dodgers. Campanella was already pretty much of a star in this league, in the Negro Leagues. He was making good money, and he wasn't going to take a chance on a fly-by-night new league, even if it was run by Branch Rickey. So he politely declined. Campanella promised the Brooklyn boss not to sign with another team without consulting him first. Then, a week later, the light went on when Campanella ran into Robinson in New York. They were both staying in the same hotel in Harlem. It was the day before Ricky was going to announce Robinson's signing with the Dodgers. Robinson said, hey, you want to play a little cards and get to know each other? And while they're playing cards, uh, Jackie said, I hear you went to see Branch Ricky. Campanella said, how did you know that? He said, well, I went there too. And, and uh, Campanella said to him, yeah, well, he offered me a contract to play for the, the Brown Dodgers. And I turned him down. And Robinson asked him, did he say the Brooklyn Brown Dodgers? And that's when Campanella realized, oh my God, Robinson is signed. He just didn't know if, you know, oh my God, have I just blown my chance? Here's the chance I've been waiting for all my life. Have I blown it? Campanella acted quickly by sending a letter to Ricky immediately upon the Barnstormer's arrival in South America. Four months later, the American dream came over the international wire. He gets a telegram in Venezuela from Ricky saying, you know, come immediately to sign a contract. And uh, he jumped on the next plane, flew back to Brooklyn, and signed a contract to play in the Dodger organization. They knew that he was qualified almost even then in 1946 to play in the major leagues, but they wanted the color line to be broken gradually by Jackie, and then one by one they would bring other Negro League players in uh, Campanella and then Don Newcomb. Campanella did not have a college education. Robinson did. That's why Robinson was the standard bearer, because he met Ricky's blueprint. It was part of his legend. It had to be Jackie Robinson. Only Robinson could have succeeded here. Campanella certainly could have succeeded. I don't know if we'd have the same legend. Ricky was looking for that kind of dynamism that Robinson had, and Campanella really did. 
In the spring of 1946, Campanella and power pitcher Don Newcomb debuted as organized baseball's first black battery after being assigned to the Dodgers' Class B affiliate in Nashua, New Hampshire. The idea was that a New England town would be less pressured by racial issues than a southern town. Campy and Newcomb had a tough time there. Not in Nashua per se, but in Lynn, Massachusetts, in Manchester. Sal Ivars was playing for the Manchester Giants, and Ivars was uh, kind of a tough guy and came up to the plate. Campanella was crouched behind the plate, had his mask on, and Ivars bent down and picked up a handful of dirt and threw it in Campanella's face. And Campanella immediately jumped out of his crouch and said, if you try that one more time, I'm going to club you to death. And that was it. Batting 296 with 96 RBIs, Campanella won the MVP award for the New England League. Then, after Jackie Robinson made history on April 15, 1947, the catcher proceeded to win a second MVP with Montreal of the International League. Campy felt ready for the bigs, but Ricky had other ideas. Paul Richards, one of the, the top baseball men at that time, watched Campanella play and said, you know, he's the best catcher in baseball whether the minor leagues or the major leagues. And if Ricky doesn't bring this guy up, he ought to go out of the emancipation business. When DeRocher wanted Roy Campanella to be his catcher in 1948, Branch Ricky had a bigger purpose for Campy. He wanted him, at least in the beginning of the year, to go to St. Paul in the American Association and be the first black player to play in the American Association. Campanella wasn't as happy about this. He said, you know, I'm a ball player. I'm not a pioneer. Using Roy Campanella like a flashcard, manager Leo DeRocher installed him as the Brooklyn catcher for one game in 1948, before he was shipped off to St. Paul in May. But with the Dodgers slumping, Ricky relented, and Campy returned July 2nd with guns blazing. Campanella sort of celebrated by going on a little tear. In his first three games, he went 9 for 12 and had two home runs and a triple. And uh, from that day on, he was the catcher of the, of the Brooklyn Dodgers. He was the leader of that Dodger pitching staff. Now, what's remarkable about that, when he came to the Dodgers in 1948, this was long before the Civil Rights Movement got underway. So here is this black man who is telling these white guys what to do. He finally comes up. He was the last piece of the Boys of Summer to be put into place. And he came the counterpoint Jackie Robinson. Cap is fighting to be a good ball player. You understand? And liking everybody, everybody liking him. Jackie wanted to change things. Campy knew that he was African American. That's all there was to it. That he was going to have a good time in life, whether he was African American or not. That bothered to Jackie a little bit. This opportunity that he received in the major leagues was so beautiful to him. And he wanted to say, hey, shut up. We're in the big leagues. Don't rock the boat. Jackie didn't agree with that. The strength of Campanella's social benevolence was tested before his second season with Brooklyn. The Dodgers went to play a series of exhibition games in the spring of 1949. One of the places they played was in Atlanta. The Ku Klux Klan are sending the Dodgers death threats. We're going to kill Campanella. We're going to kill Jackie Robinson. Ricky calls Dr. Martin Luther King, who tells Ricky, you make sure that Campanella and Robinson play. They stayed and they played, and there were no incidents. Did they fear for their life? You bet they didn't. We played a game in Miami, and we're coming back to Vero Beach. And we stopped for dinner. We all went in. None of the black players were allowed in the restaurant. Harold Parrott, who was the traveling secretary, he went into this roadside stand and got Campanella and Robinson their food and brought them back the food while they were still sitting in the bus. Now, the difference between Robbie and Campy was that Campy threw down his cigar, ate his hamburger, drank his Coke, and was happy to have it while Jackie, that food just sat there getting cold while he sat and fumed. 
catcher is the most important position on the field. If you have outstanding defense, a catcher, and a bat, you have something that only a handful of major league clubs will have in any given year. Campanella was the most important man on that team. With Campanella behind the plate and in the batter's box, the Dodgers dominated the National League, winning five pennants in his 10 years. Roy Campanella supplied the power in a powerful lineup. He was the one who got the long ball. He set records for home runs by a catcher. Probably the best defensive catcher in the National League of his time, and maybe until Johnny Bench, the best ever. He was also a great hitter, punctuated by terrible injuries. Campanella fell victim to freak accidents long before his auto crash. In 1951, a water heater explosion in his basement caused temporary blindness and burned skin off his face. But if his skin healed, the tools of his trade, his hands, were often hobbled from countless batterings behind the plate. Even though his hands hurt so much and he couldn't squeeze his glove, he would let it hit the glove, it'd go on the ground, he could still throw you out. That's how quick he was. He had these remarkable seasons in odd numbered years where he won most valuable player awards in 51, 53, and 55, and in between, he would get hurt and play in half the team's games. With a line drive swing tailored for Ebbets Field, Campanella set major league records for a catcher with 41 home runs and 142 RBIs in 1953. He was half Italian and half black, half Yogi Berra and half Josh Gibson. A remarkable symmetry between Berra and Campanella. Each of them had a very convenient short porch to hit home runs over. Each of them made it to the postseason year after year. Each of them won three most valuable players. You could not find in the history of baseball in one city two players more twins than those two. Everybody talks about the great New York debates of whether Willie or Mickey was the better center fielder. There were just as many debates about Campanella and Barrett. The debates about Campanella and Barrett were every bit as heated and bitter and ongoing as the debates about Willie and Mickey. But Campanella's Dodgers beat Barra's Yankees just once in five World Series. That glorious incandescent moment in 1955 marked the only championship won in the history of the Brooklyn franchise. That was a big thing for him, to beat those Yankees. It was a big thing for all of us, because we could never beat them. Campanella's production dropped dramatically after winning his third MVP in 1955. Saddled by nagging hand injuries, he hit just 219 in 1956, and 182 in the World Series. In an interview after the season, Robinson fired up old Hurts by suggesting that Campy's career was over. Jackie never thought anything was just great. Jackie was the most intense personality in my whole lifetime of watching baseball. Nobody like him. Uh, and Campanella was the complete opposite. Angered by Jackie's assessment, Campanella lashed back at the recently retired Robinson, calling him a troublemaker and agitator. The Negro players who came up to the Major League they went to Campy to talk to her. They didn't go to Jackie. They went to Campy because Campy was like father confessor to all of them. He was like a godfather. He just taught us how to live because he, he got there when things wasn't very good for black players. He was the one that, that you looked up to and said, hey, you know, I want to idolize myself after him on the baseball field. Pay attention to see how you could get $1,000 in your... Red 259-8136 or order online at snap2o.com. When I became the manager of the Dodgers, I went to Roy and I said, Roy, I know there's you can't walk, but there's nothing wrong with your mind. And I want you to be my coach. And his eyes it got that big. He goes, What? And I think Roy almost fell out of his chair, you know, because he's thinking, well, what can I do? And for 18 years, he was my coach. He worked with the catchers in spring training. I don't think Roy really, really believed that he was in a wheelchair at that time. It's because he was so exuberant. He knew baseball. Social, Piazza, Jaeger. They adored his expertise. The amazing thing about Campanella 
is that the same spirit in which he led a team, he called a team, is the same spirit that he lived with from all of those years. He was an inspiration to me. What a tremendous attitude he had, and it rubbed off on him. I had a struggle off the field with substance abuse, and so uh, the road that I had traveled, he had not traveled. But through his experience, he gave me strength when things turned around for me. It gave Campanella a chance to be a hero of a very different sort by showing America how to endure hardship. Campanella was the same person in a wheelchair that he had been behind the plate. We all might wish that we could absorb life's blows as well as he did. In June of 1993, Roy Campanella died of heart failure at 71. He had spent nearly half his life in a wheelchair. Gilliam is gone, Jackie's gone, Hodge is gone, all good guys. Why did the good guys go? Maybe God has said that Campanella has suffered enough. It's time for him to take a rest. When he wasn't playing baseball, Roy Campanella was usually doing something for somebody. Once, he took 600 youngsters from Harlem for a day of fun in the country. After he paid the $1,200 tab, someone suggested that he could write it off his taxes under public relations. Campy responded with a touch of anger. Man, how are you going to write off your conscience? For Sports Century, I'm Chris Fowler.